first American journalist to interview Vladimir Putin since the Ukraine invasion. 142 million views. Seven millions on YouTube, 142 on Twitter, or X that they call it now, not counting anything on the Tucker Network. Uh, this is bigger than the Super Bowl. It nearly broke the internet. It had more views than any any interview he's ever done or anyone has ever done. And um, it is obviously is going to go much higher. Legacy media is on panic mode. They're rolling out Hillary Clinton now to try to uh, de, um, depose anything that Tucker says and try to make him into, uh, I guess, a dog, a lap dog. Uh, but incredible stuff. I, I watched it. The first 30 minutes is, was about history and everything else. Fascinating stuff. Jacob Prash, your take on the interview and the whole aspect of it. First of all, he was talking to his Russian viewership as much as he was to his to the American and Western viewership. He was certainly blowing his own horn among his own people, trying to put a spin on the events taking place in Russia, as well as Russia's position in the international community. So he was not just speaking to the Americans. He was speaking to his own people. He obviously had his own script. At, at various points, he would not even answer the exact questions, precise questions asked by Tucker Carlson. He would simply continue with his own um, prescripted um, monologue, basically, or he would take the questions and he would oh, not really rephrase them, but redirect them to continue again his own diatribes against the West, against America, and against the Democrats. I have several observations concerning it, though. My first is that he was critical of, of, of the Democratic Party. And we can bet that the Democratic Party and the mainstream media are going to try to resurrect the false narrative they had the last time about collusion. They're going to say, see, he doesn't like Biden. He doesn't like the Democratic Party. He's collaborating with Trump. They're going to try to say that again. Now, they were caught lying the last time about the, the, the Steele dossier. Hillary Clinton, John Podesta, no, nobody was indicted over, over presenting a false dossier to the FBI. Um, people like Comey were never indicted. People like um, Page and people like, like uh, McCabe and, and, and people like... Uh, um, in the intelligence community who backed it, like like uh, ob obviously Clapper and and Brenner w were not brought to accounts. Either was struck, and if anybody should have been faced an indictment, it would have been struck, in my opinion. They're going to try to resurrect a version of this if they can and try to say, look, listen to what he's saying. He's against the Democrats. He wants Trump to win. There's a collusion with the Republicans. There's a collusion with Trump. They're going to try to resurrect that if they can. Um, that's what they'll attempt to do. The second observation I have is, is the lack of comprehensive response of the questions he was answering. For instance, he was trying to say that Russia has the fifth biggest economy in the world in terms of PPP. PPP is purchasing power. It's not the same as gross national product, and it's not the same as gross domestic product. It's it's something else. How much can you buy with your money? And he was saying China can buy the most. Of course, what he was not saying is that you can buy a lot more. A kilo of rice is going to cost a lot less in Nigeria or, 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 or Pakistan than a kilo of rice is going to cost in California or in England. Um, he, he wasn't making that kind of comparison. He was just saying the PPP is bigger. But he wasn't telling you that the although you can buy more with the same amount of money in China, that the average wage in China is about twelve thousand or twelve and a half thousand dollars a year. Well, you can buy more with that amount of money, but it's a lot less money. The other thing he was not being honest about, or he was he was packaging his response to avoid the reality is that China's PPP has gotten so big so fast because China is in a state of deflation. Now, deflation is as dangerous as hyperinflation. 
deflation, prices indeed do come down. Uh, and, and you get a lot more for your money. But the people who have to produce things are getting a lot less. They're paying the same price for raw materials and so forth, but they're selling them at a lower price. Deflation is as deadly as hyperinflation. So he wasn't giving the reasons for China's PPP. He was just stating certain facts non-inclusively or non-comprehensively. He was only highlighting certain aspects that he wanted people to buy into. And there are people who will do that. They, they won't understand what the PPP really means, or they won't link the high PPP in China to the low wages or to the deflation. So he was not really honest in a lot of his responses. One of the things that I would say deserves some credence, or at least should be listened to, is something that many Western economists, including American economists, are saying. By weaponizing the dollar and the SWIFT system, it is pushing people away from the dollar into things like BRICS and to alternatives. Now, again, here, he was only telling half the story. He wanted the ruble at one point to replace the dollar. Uh, obviously, that's not going to happen. Ruple is now worth about a penny or just a little over one U.S. cent. Um, there were people who wanted to replace the dollar as the world currency reserve anyway. But by the sanctions on Russia, but by freezing Russia Russian assets and by closing Russia out of the... Uh, currency system, it was uh, had an effect of, of, of giving further motivation to, to other nations going into BRICS, saying, look, the Americans can freeze our assets, they can freeze our accounts. Absolutely, absolutely. They can, they can the of, uh, so we need an alternative to protect ourselves. Now, again, these countries, particularly Russia and Iran and China, wanted to replace the dollar anyway. But by doing what we did, the question is, are we giving them, or are we putting fuel on a fire that already exists that we'd like to contain? Um, so I would say that that aspect of, of his remarks in the interview need to be considered. They need to be given serious economic consideration. But of course, the Biden administration does not have either the intelligence or the ability to do that. You're, you're dealing with not just this, uh, you know, I used to say that Joe Biden was a half senile corruptocrat. I no longer have that opinion. I must recant the view that he's a half senile corruptocrat. He's just a senile corruptocrat. <laughs> the man is not in control of his faculties. Now, have you seen, I mean, do you see the last one? He's calling, uh, was it El Sisi, the president of Mexico, shutting the border? Well, El Sisi, the president of Mexico. That's, he's, <laughs> he's talking about he's, he's, it. He said, he met Tehran. Uh, he's, he's out been, of it. He's been dead for years. He just he said he met him the other day. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh at, at you know older people that are losing. Yeah, he, he is not, a half, he's not half senile. He's just senile. Mm. 